Hi, my name is Jo Morgan. I'm a maths teacher and I'm here to tell secondary teachers what they need to know about what's on the Key Stage 2 maths curriculum. If you are teaching secondary school maths, particularly if you teach Key Stage 3, then you really need to know what your students have learnt at primary school. Now, you could find this out yourself by reading the National Curriculum. It's a 47 page document, but it might be more helpful if I talk you through some of the key points. Now, my intention is not to give teaching advice. I'm not talking about what pedagogy should look like in year seven classrooms. I'm not talking about how key stage three curriculums should be structured. All I'm doing is making sure that secondary teachers know what their pupils have been taught previously. So I'm going to pick out some of the key points, some of the things that I think secondary teachers might not be aware of and go through topic by topic and just show this is the kind of thing your student would have done before. And I think it's so important, particularly when you're teaching year seven, that you really know this stuff well. So let's start with angles. Now, angles is a topic that children learn from a really young age. They actually start the ideas, the concept of an angle all the way down in year two when they're very little. Um, and there they're really learning about the idea of turning. And then that concept of an angle develops throughout year three and four, where they're understanding the idea of a right angle being a quarter turn. And they're introduced to the idea of bigger than a right angle or less than a right angle, acute, acute and obtuse. Um, by year four, they're ordering angles by size and they're starting to look at different types of triangle and different types of quadrilateral. So that's all at a pretty young age that they're meeting these ideas for the first time. Now, by the time that students get into year five, that's when they're starting to do work that looks a lot like the work we might be doing with them in year seven. So we're continuing in year seven, a lot of the work that's introduced in year five and six in terms of measuring angles in degrees, um, being able to draw using a protractor, um, estimate angles, and also those key angle facts of angles around a point summing to 360 and angles in a straight line summing to 180. Now that's introduced in year five, and there's a lot more work done on it in year six. So students in year six are also finding angles in uh, triangles, they're finding missing angles in quadrilaterals. Now just note, they do have to know that the angles in parallelograms, the opposite angles are equal, but they are not introduced to the idea of why that is in terms of the parallel lines and the co-interior angles. So angles in parallel lines is very much a secondary topic, um, but angles in parallelograms does appear on the primary curriculum. Students at this point are also finding missing angles um, at a point on the straight line and including vertically opposite angles. So that is an angle fact that does come up at primary school, the fact that uh, vertically opposite angles are equal. So you can see they do tons of angle work at primary school um, from a very young age, introducing that, that concept, that key idea of a measure of turn. And then by year five and six, the angles work they're doing looks a lot like secondary angles work where they're identifying missing angles and solving angles problems. Now for each topic we are going to have a quick look at some key stage two stats questions just because it gives us an idea of the kind of level of difficulty that students would have worked to before and some of the questions they may have practiced in year six. On the left here we've got quite an unusual question because this is one where students are being asked to actually use a protractor to measure out some angles to draw a triangle. Now that's quite unusual for a SATS question. Um, and we know that when students come to us in year seven, most of them are pretty competent at using a protractor, but not all of them. And some students will need to practice that again. Um, the, the question on the right, when you double the size of an acute angle, you always get an obtuse angle. It's testing that key vocabulary, but also testing the students' reasoning skills. Angles questions come up a lot in SATs, um, and that means that lots of time will have been spent on angles throughout Key Stage 2, including in Year 6. There's always angles questions, um, and we have questions to do with that top left one is about the angles in the triangle um, and whether it's equilateral, so using that vocabulary. We have uh, uh, looking at acute angles, which angles are acute. Lovely question bottom left there on a diver going through um, a somersault, which is one and a half somersault and asking how many degrees they turn through. Really lovely questions. And then another one where students are having to identify acute and obtuse. 
Um, I tend to find that most students coming into year seven have a pretty good idea of acute and obtuse, and that's because they've seen that for years. They, they introduced that idea in year three, so pretty young. But the, you'll, you'll know that they might need a reminder of that, but of all the things they've done in angles, the idea of acute and obtuse is normally a thing that's really well embedded. Um, this question from SATS is one of the few that really looks like something you might get in a GCSE. Um, in terms of the kind of style of question, the kind of using angle facts, you can see here they're using vertically opposite angles and then angles in a quadrilateral to solve this angle problem. But that's the kind of level of difficulty that students will have worked to previously. And our job at, at uh, secondary school is to continue to go into more depth, add more challenge, starting from this really quite wide base of knowledge about angles that students come to us with. So the Key Stage 2 angles content, it really should be revisited at Key Stage 3. I wouldn't skip it all totally and just start on angles in parallel lines. I would revisit some of those angle facts that they've learned before, but go into greater depth and add some challenge and build on their prior knowledge into we with algebra. This is a really good opportunity to do some work on equation solving. You know, the angles in a triangle are x, 2x and 3x. What is x? That kind of thing is a great thing to do in year seven, where you're bringing in that existing angle knowledge, but you're interweaving it with new knowledge that they've learned in year seven. But of course, loads of opportunities for lots of problem solving and reasoning. Because students have done a lot of work on angles before, you can revisit it, you can revise it, but you can give them loads and loads of fantastic angles questions. The, the journey of angles throughout secondary school is, is quite a big one. There's a lot of angles content at Key Stage 3 and 4. And it might be that you're doing angles work every year. So in year 7, you might be revisiting that primary stuff, but in greater depth and adding in the algebra. And then in year 8, you might introduce parallel lines. Perhaps year 9, you might do polygons, year 10 bearings and year 11 circle theorems. Now, it might every school will have a different structure here, but that you can see that that kind of initial base really is a revisit visiting of key stage three, but going into greater depth and adding more challenge. But it is necessary to revisit it um, and make sure that students really know that stuff inside out at a really great level of depth because they're going to need it in all the work they do in year eight, nine, ten and eleven. Right. Moving on to another topic that students have done at primary school, we have number properties. Now, this is probably the sort of stuff you'd expect to be on there. Right from year four, students are understanding the idea of factor pairs. Um, in year five, that, that vocabulary of factors, multiples and prime numbers is really coming in quite a lot. Um, and students are um, understanding the idea of a common factor. They're working with prime factors. They know what a composite number is and they're being introduced to square and cube numbers for the first time. So that all happens in year five. In year six, there's more of that, including more looking at common factors and common multiples. So they may not at this point have a, a method for working out a highest common factor or lowest common multiple. Indeed, their method may be listing, which by the way, is a fantastic method and one that they could continue doing. So, for example, what's the highest common factor? We could list all the factors. What's the lowest common multiple? We could list the multiples until we find the lowest one in common. But it's likely that most primary students won't have seen what I might call a more formal method for finding a highest common factor or lowest common multiple, for example, um, by listing prime factors or any of the various methods there are for that. But they will have seen many times the idea of common factors and common multiples. Um, key stage two questions on this are common. It comes up a lot. Um, so here you can see, for example, students are having to sort numbers into primes, into certain factors, identify prime numbers and say why those numbers are prime. Um, this is something that comes up a lot on key stage two papers. And here are some more examples where you can see we have prime numbers and square numbers and factors being tested quite a lot and certainly stuff that our students would have seen before. That's not to say we can't reteach it in greater depth so we can't say to our students, you've done this before, let's recap who remembers what this stuff is and let's have some nice reasoning and challenge questions on this, on this topic that you have been taught before. So we can revisit it, but we need to know they have seen these things in the past. 
Now, statistical representations, graphs and charts, comes up quite a lot from year three up to year six. And I've summarized it here, but just to pull out the key points, bar charts and pictograms, year three, time graphs come in in year four, uh, line graphs in year five, and pie charts not until year six. So when we're teaching our students pie charts in secondary school, remember they, they have seen them before, but they haven't had a huge amount of time on them. Year six, there's lots of time spent on SATs preparation, and that means that the new content introduced there may not get a huge amount of time. So it is worth spending time on that when students join us in secondary school. Pie charts particularly have loads of opportunities to interleave proportional thinking um, and all sorts of lovely reasoning. Pie charts is a really rich topic that deserves lots of time given to it in secondary school. Um, you can see that students are quite familiar with interpreting graphs, particularly things like bar, bar charts, which they'll, they'll be very used to reading and interpreting. Now, they do have to plot these graphs, but probably haven't spent a huge amount of time plotting them themselves because it's very rare for students to be tested on plotting graphs in SATs. So just bear in mind though that students in the science curriculum in primary, which is not tested by SATs, but the science curriculum does also include plotting graphs. So students will have had practice of plotting graphs before. We know it's something that students tend to struggle with, so they will need more practice of plotting their own graphs. But as you can see, the focus in maths in primary tends to be on interpreting graphs. So you get a wide range of graph questions in Key Stage 2 SATs. Here we have a pie chart question that involves interpreting. We have a bar chart question that involves reading off figures and solving problems like how many more children did this and did that. Um, and then we have a, a line graph question that involves some negatives. So this is a really good way of testing a whole range of skills. For example, the um, pie chart question really tests proportional reasoning. And the uh, temperature question there involves negative numbers, but it's there, they do appear a lot on SATs, like I say, normally interpretation questions. So our students have seen um, graphs and charts before, um, certainly something we can revisit and go into greater depth, but this is what they've done before. Now, averages is something that has changed quite significantly. If you've been teaching maths for a long time at secondary school, you might not realise that students don't do median and mode at primary school anymore. It changed. When they rewrote the curriculum, they removed median and mode and mean is the only thing remaining. And it only comes up in year six. And that means that students aren't getting a huge amount of time to work on the mean. They're probably not getting much opportunity to do lots and lots of reasoning questions. You know, those lovely missing number questions that you can do with the mean. They're probably not getting the chance to do that because they're meeting the mean right at the end of their primary school journey. Median mode and range doesn't come up at all. That's not to say some students won't have seen it before. They may have seen it with a tutor or maybe their primary teacher covered that with them, but it's not on the curriculum. These days, since the new curriculum was launched, students only see the mean and they only see it in year six. So if you are saying to your students in year seven, what's the mode? Why can none of you remember it? That's because they haven't done it before. Um, the mean occasionally does come up. It's come up twice on the new SATs. So here's a question where it says three tickets cost five pounds, another ticket costs seven pounds. What's the mean cost of the four tickets? So that's a straightforward uh, mean calculation question. And then we have one where students are having to read off a graph and then work out a mean temperature. And that one actually involves adding together some decimals. So you can see that the mean does get tested, not all the time. And like I say, it's only introduced right at the end of primary school. So this is something that's going to need some time in year seven um, and we're going to combine it with median and mode and range and we're going to look at all those lovely comparison and interpretation questions and go into a lot more depth and mean on mean than the students would have seen at primary school. Now probability is one that's just been completely removed. Um, since 2016 this has not appeared on the primary curriculum at all. So again unlikely that your students would have seen it before. It used to be they did probability at primary school and they would have come to you with a good understanding of likelihood of certainty of things being impossible. Now it's all gone. So they won't have done any probability before and we need to know that when we introduce probability at key stage three we're introducing it from scratch. Right, fraction arithmetic. I won't go into this in detail because you can probably guess they do they do fra fraction arithmetic at primary school. They add fractions, they multiply, they divide. Um, there is a couple of key things to pull out here. So first of all, if you look at the bottom there, they are adding and subtracting fractions with different denominators and mixed numbers. So they're doing the whole lot on adding and subtracting. But for multiplying, they're only multiplying simple pairs of proper fractions. Um, 
and for dividing they're only dividing fractions by whole numbers and i think that's the most interesting bit here they are not actually doing a fraction divided by a fraction they don't see that at primary school again not to say that none of them are taught it and i'm so sure that some students do get taught this stuff but in terms of what's in the primary curriculum division would only be by an integer so a fraction divided by an integer never a fraction divided by a fraction according to the curriculum so that's the key thing to realize here. If you're doing fraction division in year seven, that is the first time curriculum wise that they'll be introduced to a fraction divided by a fraction. Um, I haven't listed all the fractions content here. I've just put fractions arithmetic. Of course, they're introduced to the concept of fractions very young. They're introduced to simplification of fractions and equivalents and ordering of fractions and improper fractions. Like all of that is throughout primary school. They do loads and loads of fraction work. So really, here I'm just focusing on fraction arithmetic. And the key thing to know is they've done all fraction arithmetic before, apart from fraction divided by fraction. The questions are everywhere. They are plentiful here. We've got some subtractions, some um, some additions, some uh, multiplication and some divisions. Just notice those division questions. Those last two there on the right are both divided by an integer. Now, there's not as much percentages content on the primary curriculum as I kind of thought there'd be. Um, students normally come to us pretty good on the concept of percentages and actually students are kind of surrounded by the language of percentages from a very young age even though it's not on the curriculum my own daughters um, have talked about percentages in the context of attendance at school and percentage marks on tests from from a, an age before they've actually understood what percentages mean percentages are kind of all around us but they're not actually introduced to the concept until year five when they first start using that symbol and they understand those equivalents of a half and a quarter and um, fractions out of 10 and, and, and you know they're starting to see those equivalents decimals fractions and percentages so that's not till year five in year six they carry on working with those equivalents but also and this is classified under ratio in the um, primary curriculum this is like a separate classification they also have to work out percentages of numbers using what we might call a build-up method so you know that idea of what's 10 percent what's five percent add them together and you've got 15 percent um, and obviously they don't have calculators at primary there's no calculators work at all on the primary curriculum anymore so this is all done very much with those non-calculator methods and what I often find when I teach um, year sevens is they're normally pretty good on those equivalents. Not all students are, but most are pretty good on those equivalents between fractions, decimals and percentages. And they're also pretty good generally with the build up method. So when you talk about, right, so how do you find 13% um, of a number? You find that a lot of students in year seven are already pretty good at that. Um, so that's something that I think tends to stick quite well in their memory, not to say that we don't need to revise it and do some more practice on it, but it tends to be something that's pretty, pretty well embedded. Um, at secondary school, there are there's loads of new percentages content, but the key thing is that we're introducing calculator methods. So multipliers being our big new percentages thing at secondary school. And then we have things like interest and repeated percentage change and all that sort of thing. But yeah, that, that sort of idea of introducing multipliers is not done at primary school unless a student is being accelerated um, and that gives us an opportunity to do lots of new percentages work with children at secondary school but certainly these kind of equivalences and the build-up methods so sort of non-calculated methods of finding percentages will have been seen before uh, a couple of examples of key stage two questions a bit of reasoning particularly in that one on the right the one on the left is basically a build-up method 35 percent of 400 pounds giving in the context and the one on the right interesting a cat sleeps 12 hours a day and that represents 50% of its life a koala sleeps for 18 hours what percentage of its life does that um, does that represent that's quite an interesting question um, but also percentages comes up a lot on the arithmetic papers and you can see these are all kind of classic build up methods I like that 99% of 200 for example um, and interesting if you look at the top four they all say the word of and the bottom two have a multiplication symbol so I think that's quite interesting in terms of decimal arithmetic and what our students are doing at primary school, they are in year um, five, they're seeing um, a decimal um, addition and subtraction, although they do do money problems in year four, which would involve some decimals. But yeah, year five, they're doing um, they're doing kind of lots of work with um, adding decimals with different numbers of decimal places. And then in year six, 
we, the multiplication is introduced. So again, it's quite late that they're meeting this stuff. Multiplying um, numbers with decimals in. So for example, a whole number multiplied by a decimal, but also using division where the answer has a decimal. So for example, using a bus stop method or short division or long division where your answer ends up with a decimal in, uh, in the answer. What they are not seeing therefore at primary school is multiplication of two decimal numbers, because notice the multiplication was always an integer times a decimal, and division by decimals, which we know is quite conceptually challenging. So the idea of, say, for example, 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.2 and that kind of thing. So um, these are the two things that are coming in for the first time at Key Stage 3. A lot of work is done on, on decimals at primary school, but not those two things specifically. Here you can see that decimal addition and subtraction comes up a lot on the arithmetic paper at Key Stage 2 SATs all of which requiring the correct kind of lining up of the of the um, the decimal point. So here you can see some examples of division and multiplication. At the top there, division by 10 and 100, so decimal divided by 10 or 100. I haven't got an example here of a division that results in the decimal, but that could come up as well. And then also multiplication, again, noting that the multiplication is always a decimal multiplied by an integer and not two decimals multiplied together. So all of operations, I think we all know that one's taught at primary. Our students come to us with all sorts of ideas about the correct order for doing things. Um, it's not introduced till year six, um, and it is tested uh, quite a lot on SATs. Just to show you those examples. So every year it's coming up on the SATs exam, and you can see that we have um, a combination of different order operation problems here. Um, so that's something that we know our students have seen before, and it's such a rich topic to go into lots of depth with at secondary school. You know, there's all sorts of wonderful problems, um, missing number problems and putting in brackets and all that kind of thing, but also um, introducing it with algebra, so doing the order operations with algebraic expressions um, and all that kind of thing. So loads of work we can do on order operations, continuing what's been started at primary and taking it through to greater depth. Uh, just another example, it does come up on the reasoning assessment as well as the um, arithmetic paper. So here's a lovely missing number problem involving the order operations. Um, it is a topic that, that we can do a lot with um, and certainly one that's really fundamental to lots of maths that follows. Now, algebra is a really interesting one because I think most people know there is a little bit of algebra at primary school. So when students are meeting algebra at secondary, we kind of want this to be the big, new, exciting thing. But they have actually seen it a little bit before. Um, but what they've seen at primary school is quite different to the algebra we're then taking them on to at secondary school. What they've seen at primary school is basically that 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 really key concept of using a symbol to represent a number. Um, so that really sort of fundamental idea of what algebra is all about. So they might, for example, see some simple formulae. Um, they might see um, some missing number problems expressed algebraically. So whereas younger in the school, they might see something like five plus something equals 27 and it might be an empty box or it might be a question mark maybe that will now be a letter so in year six they might see five plus p equals 27 what's the value of p so it's about using symbols to represent missing numbers or perhaps um, using uh, letters or symbols to represent unknowns for example x plus y equals 10 what could x be what could y be so that's the kind of algebra our students are seeing for the first time in year six. Um, so, you know, we are still in, in secondary school coming along with this big, exciting new thing. Hey, we're going to do algebra. Yes, our students have seen it before, but we're really going a lot further with algebra right from year seven. And that introduction they get in year six really helps with that kind of fundamental concept. But we've got a lot further to go with it. So it's still the big new thing they do at secondary school and that we can really engage and excite them with in year seven. So skills like collecting like terms and expanding brackets, unless a child has been accelerated by their teacher or perhaps by a tutor, they won't have done those things before. They are not collecting like terms in year six algebra, but they are um, using symbols to represent numbers and solving problems using those symbols. I'll show you some examples. 
So just to give an idea of the kind of thing that's coming up in, in SATS questions, to give you an idea of what kind of algebra students are looking at in primary school. That first question, Dev has £10, he gives away £8, what's he got left, how do you write it? OK, so it's about using letters to represent situations. Um, the one on the right, X and Y are whole numbers less than 10. What could they be? So you get the idea. This is not about collecting like terms and expanding brackets and all those other things that we introduce when students join us in secondary school. This is about using letters to represent numbers, which is fundamental stuff that really helps us to then build on that algebra journey. Um, a few more examples here that involve formulae. So this one says, um, the price of printing a t-shirt is 60p times the number of colours plus £1.25. So how much would it cost if we have three colours? So that's kind of a substitution question. In fact, substitution questions have come up in other places as well. If you look at that one at the bottom right, that is directly a substitution question. Where they're being students are being told that n is 22, so what's the value of 2n plus 9? And that's quite interesting to me because that suggests that the 2n there suggests that students have to understand that algebraic notation that 2n means 2 multiplied by n and we don't write the multiplication symbol. So it's interesting to see that that is being introduced in primary school. Right, looking at negative numbers, this one actually did surprise me, to be honest. I should have known this, but actually negative numbers are covered in primary school, but not multiplying two negatives or dividing two negatives. And I don't know why I didn't know that. Um, so it's quite helpful that I have now found that out. Um, basically, students are working with negatives from year four. So they're kind of counting backwards down into those negative numbers. In year five, they're doing some contextual work. So this is sort of work with temperature and stuff like that. So, you know, if the temperature is two degrees and it drops by five degrees, what's the temperature now? So that kind of thing. But then in year six, they're using negative numbers in context, again, temperature being a common one, and calculating intervals across zero. So that's basically adding and subtracting, um, but sort of using number lines. So if I sort of explain what I mean with an extract from the curriculum, it says using number line, students sorry, pupils use, add and subtract positive and negative integers for measures such as temperature. So for example, they might be told the temperature at this time is five degrees and the temperature at this time is negative three degrees. What's the difference in temperature? So they are having to calculate with negatives, but usually either with a number line drawn or, or they, might, they might picture one or draw one themselves. But really, this is the extent of the calculations with negatives that they're doing. So they're not multiplying two negatives and they're not dividing two negatives and they don't know those rules and how those things work. So this is a really big thing we're doing in year seven. I think I kind of assumed that they'd done more of this before than they actually had. So this is really interesting. When they come to us in year seven, they're having to do a lot of new work with negative numbers. They know what negatives are. They have worked with negatives before. But in terms of arithmetic with negatives, there's quite a lot we need to introduce at secondary for the first time. Some examples of SATS questions, these all involve uh, temperature. So, you know, we have um, temp questions like how many degrees colder was it in this place and this place? Um, reading a graph and looking at the temperature. Uh, what's the difference in temperature in these two places? So they're all kind of contextual negative number questions. Um, but like I say, no multiplication or division because that's not on the curriculum. Now, I finished going through topics in detail. I will talk in a minute about some of the topics that I haven't mentioned. But before I do that, I just want to talk to you about arithmetic. Of course, arithmetic is taught throughout primary school from a very young age, addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. And we know that students coming to us in secondary, most of them are really strong on their ar arithmetic methods. They're tested on it heavily in year six. And it's something that a lot of time is given to at primary school. So our students are normally great at it when they get to us. What you may not know is about the prescription of methods for division and multiplication. So if you have a look at the screen there, you've got um, what we might call traditional methods, traditional by someone's standards. Um, those traditional methods that are shown there are the ones that will get method marks in the SATS exam. So if, for example, a child um, uses a grid method in their SACS exam and makes a mistake, they won't get a single mark for that question. But if they use a column method for multiplication in a SACS exam and they make one little error, then they will get a method mark. OK, so here's how it looks in the mark scheme. In fact, this is what they're told at the beginning of the test. Long division and long multiplication questions are worth two marks each. You'll be awarded two marks for a correct answer. You may get one mark for showing a 
formal method. Now I am quite wound up by the use of the word formal there because formal method is not a thing. That's not that's not a math mathematical thing. That's something that the government has made up and they decided to they have decided which methods they think are formal. They have named them formal and they've done this as a way of forcing primaries to teach traditional methods. Now, I don't dislike these methods, I just dislike the government prescribing them because the government are not mathematicians um, and this doesn't seem an appropriate thing for them to do. But anyway, it used to be years ago that you could have a year seven class and ask them to do a multiplication question and you would see a whole range of different methods in the room. Some might do a column method, some might do a grid method, um, some might do um, a lattice method or gelosia, there's all sorts of different names for that. Um, and there were other things going on and people were setting their work out in all sorts of different ways. Um, and that was, that was pretty standard, say 10 years ago. Now you're gonna find that probably 100% of your students use a column method, okay? They're taught it a lot at primary school because that's the one they get marks for in the exam. That's the one they're told they have to teach. So, um, yeah, that's something you can expect your students to come to you with. It's not to say that you can't show them other ways of multiplying. We all know that a grid method is a really useful thing to lead on to other parts of maths, um, but um, that's just something you need to know. Your students will have been taught these formal or traditional methods before, um, if you're interested in why this was introduced, I have a whole video about that on my YouTube channel where I talk about the reasons the government gave for prescribing methods at primary school. Thankfully, at no point in secondary curriculum are any methods prescribed. Mathematicians um, can choose their own methods, so our students can decide whichever method they want to use for every question. But at primary school, this is the only place where students are told how they must do the maths. OK, it's something you need to know if you are teaching secondary. Now, there were lots of topics I did not mention, and I don't want to go into detail on these because for most of these topics, it's kind of obvious what students have been taught. And if you want to know more, you can go and read the curriculum. Of course, students have been taught about time, how to tell the time. Um, students are taught um, about money and how to work with pounds and pence. Reading scales, um, unit conversions, metric to metric. They do that quite young, how many centimetres are in a metre and that kind of thing, but also metric to imperial. They do a lot of work at place value from a very, very young age, as you'd expect. Um, they do work on area, and that is um, in areas of rectangles, triangles and parallelograms um, and um, the concept of area. So there's so when our students come to us in year seven, there's a lot more we can do with area, lots of reasoning on area and take them further to areas of trapeziums, areas of circles as they go through key stage three. But of course, they have done some work on area before and perimeter, of course, volume. They would have seen volume of cuboids and understood the idea of volume. Um, they do quite a lot of work on properties of shapes and solids. So, for example, about um, edges and vertices and all that kind of thing and naming shapes and solids. Um, they will have done um, work on symmetry, they have done work on coordinates in all four quadrants, so that's another place where negatives are coming up. Interestingly, shape transformations, and I didn't know this was on the primary curriculum, they do work on reflections and translations. Translations obviously not described with vectors, but described with certain number of moves, say right and up, for example. Um, they do work on Roman numerals. That's perhaps the only thing they do in primary school that doesn't follow through, in, through into the key stage three maths curriculum. They do some work on proportion and some basic ratio work. They round integers, say to the nearest um, 10 or the nearest 100. They also round decimals to the nearest integer or to one decimal place. Um, and they're introduced to some circle vocabulary, which I think is quite surprising given they're not working with that vocabulary yet, but they will have seen radius and diameter and things like that before. So all of this um, is covered on the primary curriculum, and I'm not going into detail on each of these things, um, but you can go off and read for more detail if you feel like you need to. But I just want to finish off with a few things I think people need to think about when they're teaching Key Stage 3, bearing all of this in mind. Right, first of all, sometimes people give us the impression that we shouldn't be teaching any primary stuff at all in secondary school. Everything that's been done primary, leave that and start with some fresh stuff. And I don't think that's necessarily good advice. 
we shouldn't assume, we shouldn't assume anything, but we definitely shouldn't assume that every single student in a comprehensive school has a full and deep understanding of every topic on the primary maths curriculum. I think that would be a silly thing to assume. Um, just bear in mind, it's a bit like GCSE. In 2019, the expected standard, so that's a student who got a scaled score of 100, meant that they got around, they got 53% in their maths stats. OK, so that means they got around half of what they were assessed on correct and then they came through at expected standard. But it also means they got around half of it wrong. So that means they don't know it all really, really well, just like at GCSE. It would be foolish of any year 12 teacher to take a A-level class and assume that they had absolutely brilliant knowledge of um, quadratics and thirds and indices and all those things. It would be silly to assume that. In the same way, it is silly to assume that year sevens have a very deep understanding of every single thing on the primary curriculum. That would make no sense to assume that. We shouldn't assume anything. We should figure out by assessing our students in the lessons what their starting points are. Saying that, though, we should have really high expectations of our students. They are taught really well. The primary curriculum is brilliant. Primary teachers are brilliant. And many of our year seven students will have excellent fluency, particularly in arithmetic, times tables. They're all amazing at times tables these days. Most of them are. And they should have pretty well developed reasoning and problem solving skills because they do so much of it. Um, now, they may need their memories jogged because it's a long summer break. So we should be doing lots of key stage two retrieval practice right from the outset. So right from the very beginning of year seven, we should be giving them lots of opportunity to remember what they did in primary school using retrieval practice. OK, so we should be doing that all the time. We must have high expectations of them. OK, yes, they would have got some stuff wrong in their stats, but still they've learned this stuff before, jog their memories and they've got a really good starting point. OK, we should not be teaching all this stuff again. We should be teaching it knowing that they've done it before and teaching it as a refresher and as a going into greater depth. Just bear in mind, they join primary school and most students are quite excited about secondary maths. They've heard that there's some really tricky stuff. They've heard there's some algebra. They're excited about what's to come. And if you just go in straight away with a repeat of primary maths, they will just hate it immediately. It will turn them off maths from day one and it'll be hard to get them to love maths again. OK, we don't want to patronise them. We want to make it interesting. We want to make it challenging. Now, there are various ways of doing that. At my school, we're a bit controversial. We start with algebra from the beginning of year seven. It's our first topic. And some schools really don't think that's a good idea. But what we're doing there is we're grabbing their attention. We're making maths interesting from day one. We're saying this is not exactly the same as primary maths. We're going to do some stuff that's a bit different. But throughout the year, we, of course, revisit some of those primary topics and go into greater depth on them. Of course, we do that. It would be silly to suggest that we shouldn't do that. But we do that while keeping the students engaged and interested because we give them loads of challenge. Of course, you're going to assess your students. I don't necessarily mean through baseline testing or anything like that, that you could do that. I mean, during lessons, you need to get your starting points right and the level of challenge right for the students in front of you. And this will differ by in every school and it will differ for every class. But you need to get the challenge right and the starting points right for your particular class. If you want to teach them angles and you give them an activity on measuring and some of them can't measure angles. Yes, I did it at primary school, but if they can't do it, you're going to need to teach it to them again. The rest of them, however, might be be brilliant at measuring angles already and go and do a really lovely measuring task to deepen and strengthen and build their fluency. It doesn't mean that not everyone will need a bit of teaching on that, but some of them will and some of them won't. And we need to assess them and figure that out for ourselves. Um, so my message is don't be scared to recover primary content, but if you're going to do that, make sure you acknowledge they've been taught it before. So I'll normally say to my students, You've done this before at primary school, so I'm expecting you all to be brilliant at it. Let's recap what you've done before and go into greater depth. So, for example, if I was teaching order operations, I, may, I might say, right, now I know you know the right order to do this in. I might put up a, a calculation on the board that's got a multiplication and addition in it. I know you know the order because you've done this before. So why don't you tell me what you remember? And then we're going to look at some really good problem solving with this skill. OK, so that's how we're going to do it. We're going to acknowledge they've been taught it before and we're going to go into some greater depth. We're going to strengthen their understanding because a second look is powerful. When you've been taught something once and you come back a year later and you're taught it again, it's really powerful. It really strengthens your knowledge. So a second look is powerful, whether that's looking at something they've done at primary again or taking something in year nine they've done in year seven. A second look works really well. 
go into greater depth on these topics. OK, acknowledge the, for your students that you're doing that. I know you've done this before at primary school, but we're going to go into greater depth. OK, so we're not just reteaching stuff. We don't need to do that. It was taught well the first time, but we do need to take the stuff that's been taught and strengthen and build on that interweave it with new secondary content, bring in that equation solving, for example, with area, perimeter and angles, it's great opportunities to bring in algebra. Make sure you're exploring non-examples and boundary examples to really deepen understanding. Provide loads of opportunities for reasoning and problem solving. Say, here's what you were taught at primary school, you're already good at this, so let's solve some problems using this knowledge. Maybe explore some alternative methods if that's appropriate. Say, right, um, for example, in year eight, right at primary school, you were taught how to find percentages this way. Why don't we look at how to do it this really efficiently using a calculator and then we can introduce multipliers. Um, incorporate calculator use at every opportunity. There are opportunities right from a very um, early on in year seven to introduce calculators, not as a way of working out the answer, but a way of supporting the building of understanding. I have a on my YouTube channel, I have a video about how to do that. Um, find out about representations and approaches taught in feeder primaries if you can. Now, this advice kind of always annoys me a bit because I'm told I must go to the feeder primaries and speak to the teachers about how they teach maths. It depends where you live. In some places, your secondary school might only have one or two feeder primaries. Um, I live in a London borough where we have a huge number of feeder primaries. Our students are coming from all over the place. So it's not practical for us to speak to every one of their maths teachers in detail. However, you could even ask the students yourself, like when you're doing a question, have you seen this represented with a bar model before? Have you seen this represented in this way before? Like it's, it's a, work, uh, a conversation worth having with students. If you're teaching Key Stage 3, just make use of all these amazing resources and rich tasks that we can use at Key Stage 3. There are so many of them to really enrich our teaching. So we can take what they've done before, build on it, deepen their understanding and use all these wonderful tasks that are available. Primary teachers do an absolutely incredible job. OK, they have the harder job than us, I think. So they have to introduce the fundamental mathematical concepts. Imagine having to introduce number for the first time. Imagine having to introduce the ideas that underpin addition and subtraction for the very first time at a very young age. That is a tricky job. They do a fantastic job. It's our responsibility to build on those strong foundations. We take that amazing work they've done at primary and we build on it and we deepen understanding and we strengthen their knowledge and we introduce new secondary content. But all the time we are building on what they've done before. OK, and in order to do that, we need to know what they've done before. So here are a few things you might want to read if you want to find out more. Um, I've put some links in here that you can check out by downloading the slides. Um, and I hope this has been really helpful for you just to um, get a better understanding of your students' starting points of what they've done before. I hope it answers some questions or perhaps told you some things you didn't already know. And finally, I spent half a day of my Christmas holidays uh, doing the research for this, making the presentation and recording it. And if you want to say thank you for that, then please buy me a coffee. If you go to buymeacoffee.com slash mathsgem, then you can just buy me a drink and that will make me really happy. Um, and um, if there's anything you want to let me know, if you want to pass me any feedback, then you can tweet me at mathsgem or you can contact me. All the contact details are on my blog, resourceaholic.com. Um, I hope this has been helpful. Thanks very much for listening.